has a graduated ramp timer in it for the LED lights to simulate uh, daylight, you know, morning sun, so it doesn't shock the fish. It's uh, really cool. If you, you can see it just getting brighter and brighter as it as it ramps up. It would be better if the overhead lights went on. You can appreciate it more. But it's really showing the level of technology they put in these systems. Plus, this is not a plastic one. This is a glass uh, nano. It's very, very nice. Very well made. Pretty cool, right? We, had asked, we got asked by a bunch of members to bring fish in, so uh, I kind of want to present that to you guys. If you ever want to see something in a future auction, let us know so we can go out and look for it. So we can go out and source and you know meet new people and hopefully try to bring something you know as good as what we had this auction. Overall, I mean, it was it was a great day. Um, we were right at the, like the 350 bag mark where where we want to be for an auction. The club is a hobby, new fish that people you know having uh, haven't seen yet or. So if, once again, the only way that we can get that is by people going out there. I can't do it all myself, he can't do it all himself. Go out there. If you see something you like, tell us. Because then we'll find whoever sells it. We'll find if the pet store sells it and if Bill can get it, this way we can get it out to you guys. So let's see. Christmas party, right? Shelley. Bill Gaskell is the party chairman. He's the sub man. He's, okay, he's the sub chairman. <laughs> all right. Do anyway, I need to appoint him for that? Yes, definitely. Uh, we all asked that, that if you can, and you plan to attend, uh, bring some kind of cover dish. And the meeting next month will be here at 7. Yeah. We do that because so normally that meeting runs an extra hour. So we're trying to get out by 9, 30, 10. So 7 o'clock here. Uh, let me get the date for you. That would be, it, it'll still be the 14th. The 14th. I'm going to open it up with you guys. If you want to see something, if you're interested in anything, whether it be a particular type of fish, a new gravel that's on the market, let us know. This way, maybe we can find a speaker that can talk on it. Elections. Elections are coming up. I will no longer be running for president, so we need someone else to um, to, to, out, to captain the ship. Um, we're also we're also looking for a secretary. So, would anyone like to nominate someone else or run for any positions? Well, knew that was coming up. Well, <laughs> All right, uh, we'll bring that up at the board meeting then to discuss what uh, we're going to have to appoint someone then. We're going to have to appoint someone. Oh, thank you. Uh, going to be talking about the little guys this time. The biggest trend in the hobby, both the freshwater and the saltwater side, is towards smaller and smaller tanks with smaller and smaller inhabitants. Um, Rachel O'Leary and I wrote a book a couple of years ago about nano aquariums. But we'll talk about them a little bit more as we get into it. So, um, I did not take all the pictures. I gotta give everybody else credit. Uh, me working on one of my nano tanks at home and it's a friend of mine's tank there on the left with the beta in it. But this is really what we're talking about, small tanks. Uh, for the book, they had us define nano tanks as anything under 20 gallons. Again, that's not really the way I would describe them because to me, the most common, most popular tank in the hobby is a 10 gallon tank. So as far as I'm concerned, that's your starting point. So anything that's a nano tank is gonna be smaller than 10 gallons. Anything above that's not a nano in my opinion, because not a, you know, that's just where everyone starts. Things that you've gotta consider with a nano tank are very much the same as what you have to consider for a larger tank, but you've gotta keep more things in mind. You know, you have to have a nice stable spot for it to go. Not having it in an area where it's gonna get drafts or you know, it's gonna get sunlight is actually much more important on a smaller tank because it can, things can change in there very quickly. Uh, for the most part in freshwater, what we're doing in, in nano tanks is planted tanks. You know, certainly people are doing with no live plants as well. We need to make sure that we've got light that's gonna grow our plants. Now, contrary to what you'll read in almost every planted tank forum on the net, you know, and remember, if you're reading it online, 90% of it's wrong. It's real easy to go into a forum somewhere and claim to be an expert. And you just call people names and yell at them, try to be the one with the loudest voice when somebody disagrees with you. We see it all the time. So don't always believe what you read. Uh, you'll see a lot of times that you shouldn't use actinic. And even people who are really, really do have a lot of knowledge in plants will be out there telling you sometimes don't use actinic lighting. Don't use the blue. You don't want the blue on planted tanks. And they're wrong. 
They're wrong for a number of reasons. But the biggest one, if you go out there and you start looking at scientific research, at the scientific papers, is the same light spectrum that the corals are absorbing, the, the, the uh, zooxanthellae and the corals are using, which is at 420 to 460 nanometer, which is the actinic blue range, that's the same light spectrum that most of the aquatic plants are utilizing. The other thing that I find really is if you're doing any red plants especially, with the actinic on there, you'll get much brighter red. You know, if you think about it, you remember back to that physics class you took in high school. A co the color of an object is the color of light that it's reflecting. So if it's reflecting red light, that means it's pulling in the blue. So it just makes sense. If you're using standard fluorescence, you need to remember that the spectral output of those will shift over time and their intensity decreases over time. If you're using fluorescent lights, you need to change them a minimum of once a year. Ideally, probably even a little bit more often than that. We need to feed our plants. You know, you got to feed your fish. You also have to feed your plants. There's a lot of different planted tank substrates on the market. I'm still an old style guy. I like using this stuff. I like using the, the pure laterite. Lets you use any kind of a fine gravel that you want to use, and a finer gravel is better. You can go to a sand if you want, but that can pack a little bit. I like a very fine gravel. Uh, and I always put a box of the pure laterite underneath it. Even if I'm using a planted tank gravel, I'm probably gonna use this because I've used it so successfully for so many years. I like using the uh, substrate heaters. You get that little bit warmer water in the bottom in the substrate than you have on, up in the surface. Does a couple of things. A, it simulates what would be a more natural occurrence, especially if you're looking at like Southeast Asian streams and things. The substrate is always warmer than, than the water itself. You've got all that decaying organic matter anywhere that's got a lot of leaf litter. It's gonna be warmer in the substrate because you got all that decay going on. Um, so that's more natural. It also creates a little bit of a convection current. So it keeps the water moving a little bit through the substrate, which again, makes more things available to the uh, roots. And one of the things that you wanna to try to visualize is not just what the tank's gonna look like when you set it up, but what it's gonna look like a year down the line. That's really your goal, should be that one year out. So you need to plan your aquascape so you know what to put where. It takes a planted tank, in my opinion, a full year to really come into its own. You know, they should never look bad, but by the time they're a year old, they're really looking good. It can really be helpful when you're starting out doing it to draw them out. You know, think about what, what plant you wanna put where, think about where your focal points are gonna be. This is in a 65 gallon tank. I actually did this one for an article, series of articles in TFH a number of years ago. Where, you know, I've got that nice piece of driftwood. I wanted to base it around that. You can see it up in here, up in here, and it comes down here and it goes out and across there. You know, I got a rock over here. If you're using rocks, you want to try to have the rocks match the substrate as closely as possible. If your rocks are a different color than your substrate, it doesn't look natural. They don't belong there because your substrate is made up of those rocks that were broken down into smaller pieces. It's just how nature works. You need to think about where your focal points are going to be. You want to use the golden ratio or the golden section. So roughly what that means is about a third of the way in from the ends. You never should have a focal point dead center in the tank. If you have that, you will unconsciously try to see symmetry in the tank. No matter how hard you try in a planted tank, it will never be symmetrical. Um, think too about where you're going to be looking at the tank from. If you're looking at the tank from this side to that side, that's the way you want to build it. And that's the way this one was designed so that it all goes up. So it pulls the eye of the beholder in. So now we're going to talk about plants. We're going to kind of break them down into a few different groups here. We'll start with plants that grow out of a rosette. Uh, so this is going to be things like the crypts, the echinodorus, the sword plants, uh, valisnerias, sagittarias, things like that. Um, lots and lots to choose from here. You want to think about the leaf shape and the leaf color. You also want to consider that when you're planting your aquascape. You want a plant that's a different color and a different leaf shape than the one that's behind it. That the point right here where the leaves start to grow and the roots go down, that should be above the substrate. If you get plants in and they don't have a lot of roots on them, you need to push them down a little bit further to get them to stay, that's okay, but make sure two, three weeks in, you go in and pull them back up a little bit. That's actually a leading cause of death on sword plants. You plant your sword plants too deep, they can drop all their leaves and wind up dying out. Uh, and understand the plants you're getting, like things like the crypts, you're gonna get them in, they're gonna look gorgeous, you're gonna put them in, you're gonna watch them fall apart in front of your eyes. It's just natural when you're changing the conditions and lighting and water conditions on, on crypts, they die back. They will come back up. Um, some of the old favorites, especially for nanotanks, corkscrew valve, the old original corkscrew valve. Those of you who've been in the hobby 
as long as I have, will remember you never walked into a store in the 70s and didn't see some of that. In the crypts, you can get any shade of red or green that you want. You can get some browns in those. You get a lot of interesting leaf shapes. Plants that grow out of a bulb. So most of these are going to be different, actually, uh, water lilies. A lot of miniature water lilies. Oh, rhizome plants. It's gonna be our things like our Anubias and all the different types of java ferns and bulbitis. You know, some of the easiest plants in the hobby to grow. None of these need a lot of light. None of them are particularly demanding about water conditions. Uh, in particular, some of them, like the java ferns, if you have too much light, they don't do well. Stick with things like Nana or Petite or Coffee Folia, which is that one. That's my favorite of the Anubias. Um, Gracilis is the other one I really like. It's a little bit larger. These all are gonna prefer to be tied onto a rock or a piece of driftwood. They don't have true roots. What they have are hold fast. They like to grab onto things and grow on there. And the rhizomes will just get longer and longer. Plant doesn't really go different directions. It just goes one direction on, along the rhizome. Uh, bunch plants. You know, the sky is the limit on bunch plants. Well, these are going to have nodes along the stems. You can see them right here. The key with the stem plants is when they start getting taller than you want, you pinch them off right above one of the, right below one of the nodes, and you take the top of, of that plant that you've just pinched off and plant it in a substrate, and it'll grow and do just fine. And then you go back on the original stem and go down to the next node and pinch it or cut it off right above that node, and that will encourage the plant to branch there, so you get bushier plants over time. Uh, most of these in a nano tank are going to be best suited to use in the background, because again, take advantage of their height and the rate at which they grow. If you put them in the foreground, you're going to be pinching them off quite often. I'm going to start with a few things here that kind of are, you know, when you think back about the history of the hobby and the people who really have always kept nano tanks, for the most part, that's been the guppy people and the killifish people. In the live bearers, obviously all the guppies, all the endlers live bearers, uh, all your micro pacilias, this is uh, all pare is that species that's these are all naturally occurring color variants of that species and they will occur within a single population in the wild you know the endlers over here great fish guppies in any flavor you want and don't overestimate underestimate the wild guppies some of the most spectacular fish on the planet i think if i ever had to sit down and list what i thought were the 50 most colorful fish on the planet at least half of that list would be killifish not always great community fish you want to be aware a little bit of what their behaviors are and which ones can be a little nippy. You know, sometimes if uh, you've got something else that's got a little bit longer fins, you don't want to put these guys in. Um, you know, if you're keeping fancy guppies, some, you know, <laughs> things like the, uh, the liar tail up here, chocolate liar tail, chocolate Australia, beautiful fish. You put that in with, with male fancy guppies, you're not going to like how the guppies look for very long. Uh, you just have a pair of these or a male and three or four females and you know, watch the spawning behavior in there too. It's always interesting to add. And then my favorite group of fish, the anabantoids and their allies, all the labyrinth fish. A lot of you like cichlids, I'm sure. The reasons you like cichlids will also draw you to these. If you like cichlids because of their color, even just from this small sampling, you can see that there's plenty of color in this group. If you like cichlids because of their intricate behaviors, they're like the low level fish compared to a lot of the anabantoids. The uh, breeding behavior of mouth brooding betta or mouth brooding, you know, something like the uh, little chocolate garamis, samurai garami up there, compared to a, a mouth brooding cichlid, it's just completely different. You got a lot of tenopumas, micro tenopumas, uh, different, all the different chocolate cichlids on there. A honey garami, one of the most, one of my very favorite fish. That's actually a wild honey garami. That's what they look like most of the time when they're wild and then they get that beautiful honey color with the red, the uh, dwarf garami. There's a couple of the captive bred color forms. There's so many of them, all different shades of reds and blues and greens. You wanna do something predatory? That's a little Asian leaf fish, a little Nandus. It's a three inch predatory fish. It'll eat anything that fits in its mouth. Bettas, and there are over 90 species of bettas. If your only experience is with the so-called betta splendens that you see in shops, Everything you know about bettas is wrong. That's the exception to all the rules. All the wild types, including the wild ones of that species, you keep them all together. You keep males together, keep males and females together, so you get to see the behaviors. You've got fish in this group that will, the females will guard, and it's the males that have, they'll hold the eggs, unlike cichlids and some of the more common fish. Uh, the females will actually guard the males. 
Males guarding, he's holding the eggs and the females guarding the males, trying to keep other females away, trying to keep predators away, because there are certain fish in the beta group that sometimes they'll spawn and they'll mouth brood, and other times they'll build a bubble nest and they'll spawn that way. And you can have the same pair go back and forth. We think that mouth brooding evolved from bubble nesting, but we don't know for sure. We think mouth brooding was an adaptation to changing environment where water was starting to flow instead of being stagnant. Because obviously if you're stagnant, you can build a bubble nest. It's not gonna get washed downstream. Once that water's moving, you can't do that so well. Licorice garamis, um, some of the most spectacular of the nano fish that are available in the hobby. I separate these out because these are not beginner fish. You've got to really know what you're doing to keep these successfully long term. None of these are going to do well on a diet that consists primarily of dry food uh, or even frozen food or freeze dried food. They really need live food to do well. They're very small fish. There's only one or two of them that are capable of even getting to two inches. Most of them are going to be about an inch and a quarter, maybe an inch and a half on a really big one. Live foods are an absolute necessity. It's got to be small live foods because they have a tiny mouth. The cyprinids, everybody's kept these at one point or another. This is going to be fish like your barbs and danios and rasporas, uh, minnows that we have around here, even a lot of, you know, your various sharks and things, the freshwater sharks, most of them are, are in the family. Lots and lots of great possibilities for small tanks here. In white clouds, a lot of the smaller, the, uh, smaller rasporas and all the trigonostigmas, which is the harlequin types, that's Espa I. Another one of my very favorite fish. Uh, all your danios, the uh, kilas. That's the uh, daddio. Uh, now I think it's neo kila now. Daddy bergeri is the species. Great, great fish. Carisons, all our tetras and tetra allies. Again, you know, some of those, the fish that probably attracted some of you to the hobby. You know, neon tetras. Hard to beat them in a nano tank. It's really where they, they shine their best. But even better than, than the neons are gonna be the green neons, which is simulans. That's actually the one in the picture there. And then the cardinals being a little bit bigger. Cardinals, I probably wouldn't put in anything smaller than about eight to 10 gallons. They just get a little bit larger, need a little more, more place to move around. One of my short list of the very best fish in the hobby is this one right here. And again, these are not in good color. They were too new. Uh, that's the black morpho tetra or the black darter, the, the uh, morpho tetra or the black darter tetra. It's a tetra that thinks it's an epistogram. It breeds in caves, and the males guard the eggs and guard the cave, guard the nest, guard the babies until they're free swimming. But even something, again, like gold tetras. Bread and butter fish in the hobby for the last 50 years. Phenomenal, phenomenal fish. Small, real metallic, shines really well. School's great, just hard to beat it in a small tank. All the pencil fish are gonna work well, uh, especially like your dip tail types and your smaller ones. If you ever have a chance to get this one, this is Nanostomus anduzi. Amazing fish. And things like the pencil fish, the, the uh, dip tails rather, depending on where they come from, there's actually three different color morphs of that fish. Um, the ones from Colombia have red in the bottom part of the, uh, the tail fin. The ones from uh, Peru do not. Dwarf cichlids, most of the epistogrammas, few others as well, but uh, most of the epistogrammas can go in a tank of 10 gallons or smaller. Um, obviously, if you're going smaller, look for one of the smaller species. Obviously, a small group, but the big ones in this group are still getting three or four inches. So um, stick with the smaller species. Easy fish to breed. Even if you're setting that up in a community tank with some tetras and stuff schooling up above them, they'll still breed on the bottom in a little cave or a little hollow in the driftwood, really neat to watch. Uh, other New World Dwarf Cichlids, obviously there are rams. I'm still partial to wild rams. I think they're still the best. They're the hardiest. Um, if you're getting typical Asian or Florida bred rams in a pet shop, if you try to buy them when they first get them and medicate them for flukes, for gill flukes, before you put them into a display tank. Checkerboard, little checkerboard cichlid, little dicrosis. Um, there's another one here, but this one's a little bit bigger. That one is uh, probably the best one of the bunch. Um, does, again, does great in smaller tanks. Beautiful pattern, beautiful finish. Uh, Biotechus is some, one that some people will try in a small tank. I'm actually not a fan of this one in a real small tank. Um, African cichlids, there are some, a number of great options. A lot of the shell dwellers from Tanganyika, especially the smaller ones like Multifasciatus and, and a few of the ones that are similar to that, fantastic nanofish. Um, you know, five gallon tank full of shells, you're gonna wind up with a hundred of them in there. 
you're gonna be taking them out as fast as you can get them out because they'll breed so successfully in there. The smaller gelitochromis are great. Uh, you know, there's transcriptus in the middle, Dick Feldi on the upper right, and then the Crebensis types. Uh, some of those get a little bit large, so research from like Sacramontis for sure you don't want to use, but your, your, uh, your Taniatis types and your Polker types are all okay in a 10 gallon tank. Uh, rainbows and blue eyes, not the big Melanotania, not the Chilotherina, not the, the uh, Glossolepis, but the smaller Melanotania and then all the little pseudomugles, pseudomugles and things like that. Um, the Eryotherina werneri, the, the thread fin, great nano fish. But precox, you know, dwarf neon rainbow, fantastic fish. Gobies, gudgeons, there's a lot of them again, and we're seeing more of them. Things like the Empire gudgeon, the upper, one in the upper left, that, you know, was on one of my bucket list fish for 30 years that six or seven years ago started coming in in big quantities. You're seeing a lot more gobies coming into the hobby. So research them a little bit, figure out the size that they're going to get before you get them. You know, there are some that are going to get 12, 18 inches long. You don't want those. Uh, unless you've got a really big tank. Um, but even if you want something predatory, this little guy up here only gets about three inches long. Again, eats everything that fits in its mouth. There's even some freshwater gobies, or brackish, or uh, blenny rather, or brackish, brackish water blennies. This is a juvenile and the adult of this one comes out of India, uh, available occasionally. It's coming in again, hillstream loaches and, and regular loaches, lots of them stay small. Um, neat, neat fish. The, the monk eye in the middle there, is, you know, if I have to sit down and list the 10 best aquarium fish of all time, that one's probably on the list. Um, small fish will take out snails if you're having a snail problem. Doesn't bother anybody, real active flits around. A lot of the hillstream loaches are very popular these, these, these days. Um, they like a lot of flow, but it's not a necessity for them. The rosy loach lives sympatrically with the galaxies. So if you're keeping them, you can keep the two of them together and have a nice little biotope tank. The Cori Duradne catfish, lots of Cori's stay small. Again, we were over 200 species of Cori's. Probably 30 or 40 of them are suitable for 10 gallon tanks and smaller for their whole lives. You know, you don't want to get something that's going to get three, four inches long, but things that are going to max out around two inches or so, there's quite a few. Um, best one of all of them is probably Hebrosis because it actually acts like a Cori cat. This is Aspidorus posseradiatus, another really nice one that maxes out a little over an inch. Uh, if you want to get into things like the Pygmaeus or Hestatus, which is somewhat similar to that, they tend to be more midwater schooling fish. So a little different. You're going to act a little bit more like a tetra. Loricariids, hey, we got to have cleanup crew, right? Guys in the upper left here, common otocinclus cats do a fantastic job. They're available in most shops. Uh, lots of other types of otocinclus, uh, things like the Peruvian orange here, which is a beautiful fish. The zebra, which is another Peruvian one. Um, also do a good job. They don't eat as much algae, I don't find, as the regular ones, but they're all good. Miscellaneous fish. Uh, lots and lots of other species out there. You got some little puffers that stay small. You want to be careful what you put them in with. They can be a little nippy. Um, things like the little Peltiobagris ornatus on the bottom right. Nice little catfish, schooling, peaceful catfish. Gets about two inches long. Behavior kind of similar to an iridescent shark, but not quite that active, but in a much smaller package. A West African pipefish, that's any Acampus ensorgii. Beautiful, beautiful fish. Um, you know, think seahorse basically with a different shape and red and blue stripes. Um, phenomenal fish, does like a lot, it's gonna require again a lot of live food. Inverts, um, shrimp. About any color you want, you can find in a shrimp these days. Really, that's about when the whole interest in nano tanks really started to skyrocket, was when all the different shrimps started coming into the hobby. Again, though, on shrimp, do a little research. Figure out where they're from and what their water conditions are and what their requirements are. Snails, again, um, tremendous diversity out there. My favorites are still the zebra nearites. Uh, the nearites have the advantage that the uh, larvae and the young snails need to have brackish water to survive. So in a straight freshwater aquarium, they're going to reproduce, but they're not going to survive. You're going to need to add some salt to the water to get them to survive. So you don't have to worry about them taking over your tank. That's uh, micro crabs on the left there. And they're again, probably a detritivore. We think they probably feed on a lot of other things as well, but mainly detritus. Yeah, if you're as into this as I am, you might want to look for podcasts on the net. These are some of the best ones you'll find. Uh, Frank Falcone from down in Millville. This is a program he was doing for a while. Um, you know, basically anybody who's anybody was in there. Um, fascinating talk with Ken Kennedy about all the, uh, the Philippine angels. Uh, he's the guy who developed Philippine blues and all of those. 
And his dad was the original exporter of marine fish from the Philippines. So fascinating guy, uh, interesting family and lots of familiar names on there. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to begin. Minimum bid on every item is at least $5 unless we know it otherwise. This is lot number 30. It's a $20 gift card to Pets Plus, the store where Mark De Niro works. Who wants to start me off with five bucks? That's a 75% discount if you're doing the math at home. Anybody want $5 for a $20 gift card? I have five over there. Anybody give me seven? I have five dollars. Want somebody for seven? I got seven. You want it for nine? Nine? Eleven? Sure, 13. Okay, I got 11 going once, twice, sold, $11. All right, this is 25 feet, three quarter inch PVC. I feel like I could do it in my sleep. And the retail price would be 30 bucks. Five bucks for the host, five. Looking for six, anybody got six? Five going once, five going twice, sold, $5. Right there, $5. This is a super clean 5 to 20 gallon power filter with media. New in the box? Yes, it is. New in the box. Still wrapped in its plastic. Let me start with having $5 for the filter. This is a $20 retail. $5 in the back. You may want it for seven. Well, that seems like a $5 auction night. Five going once, five going twice. Sold. All right, roll it up and smoke it, as they say in North Jersey. This is lot B15. It's not one, not two. It's three plants in two sizes. You could have all three plants for $5 if you put up your hand right now. <laughs> Look at all the stuff in here. You can make a feast for the rest of the year. All kinds of stuff from Tetra, Jungle, and so forth. Any one of these things is worth $5. You could throw the rest out. Somebody give me five bucks for the whole bag. Look at all that stuff, it's heavy. Anybody? Sold. Thank you for the mercy bid. <laughs> hey, look, Chris just gave me his wood. <laughs> this is lot. This is lot B six. This stuff sinks instantly, does it not, Bill? It does indeed. Yeah. It's Malaysian driftwood. So you don't have to bother with the whole thing where you wait it down for six months. Yes. Yes. Nice piece of decorative wood would fit nicely in a tank of this size, perhaps. Five dollars for the big piece of wood. Anybody? Five? Looking for six? Did you want for six? He can have it. Don't be so gentlemanly. Take them out. This is a capitalist society we live in. He's just helping me out. Five going once, twice. So there's five angels in the bag. Five. Sold. Five. Anybody? Sold. You really don't need me. You can cut out the middleman and just mark everything five bucks. It's bad when the runners are buying the stuff right off the table. And Lot number B18, two albino quarry catfish. This is an awesome nano fish, yes. but there's two of them. Somebody, five bucks. Five dollars going once, going twice. Sold, five dollars.